Hi, I'm Micah Halpern. Thank you for joining me today as I do some thinking out loud. Our first segment is called Background Briefing. The first thing I've been thinking about is the rise in attacks against Jews in the United States. 20 years ago, I was convinced that anti-Semitism was a thing of the past. I was sure, certain that is, that we were living in a more enlightened world, a more open society, more understanding world. I would even chuckle to myself when someone from the older generation spoke about anti-Semitism. Old school, I would think. They were too old to realize that the world has changed. Still steeped in post-Holocaust thinking, I firmly believed that the new age, Zionism, fortified by a powerful democratic Jewish state of Israel, had kicked anti-Semitism far out of the arena of hate that has so for such a long time encircled and enveloped Jews. For our part, we were now proud Jews, no longer cowering, self-effacing Jews. As for everyone else, expressing anti-Semitic attitudes or slurs was simply not politically correct. Anti-Semites were not lurking behind every tree and around every corner. Expressing anti-Jewish attitudes had become unacceptable. Public displays of anti-Jewish behavior was derided, not applauded. It had no place in our society, not officially or unofficially, certainly not in public, and not even in the private settings. Or so I thought. I wrote about it, I lectured about it. But that was then, and this is now. And I was so wrong. Anti-Semitism has come back and come back with a vengeance. It's skyrocketing. Jews know it, they feel it. They felt it even before Kanye West fueled the fires. Fires he was able to fuel because they were already burning. A new study released by the ADL, the Anti-Defamation League, documents the rise of this Jew hatred, a term I prefer over anti-Semitism. They document it with facts and figures. The ADL cataloged last year's hate-infused acts against Jews, and the findings are staggering. In 2022, there were 3,697 reports against Jews, attacks against Jews or Jewish property an increase of 36% over 2021. The ADL has been reporting these facts since 1979, and in their 44 years of research and reportage, the numbers have never been higher. There was a huge spike in bomb threats. White supremacist attacks against Jews doubled. Attacks on Orthodox Jews increased by 60%. Troubling certainly scary for sure, but not what troubles me and scares me the most. What sends shivers down my spine are the numbers of attacks against school kids in grades K through 12, the formative years, the innocent years, the vulnerable years. In 2022, attacks in K through 12 schools increased by 49%, according to the ADL report. Quote, the 232 incidents of anti-Semitic vandalism in K through 12 schools in 2022 represent 53% increase from the 152 incidents tabulated in 2021. Of the 2032 vandalism cases recorded, swastikas were present in 88% of the K through 12 school vandalism cases, 205 incidents. Vandalism incidents included messages such as kill all Jews, 6M oven, Hitler was right, and Jews not welcome. The report gave further examples of further attacks, of verbal attacks against Jews. Samples of graffiti scrawled on walls and doorways and school lockers. One student was pelted with, ooh, Jew, why don't you kill yourself? In the middle of a math class, a student shouted, if anyone celebrates Yom Kippur today, you can die. Harassment, bullying, taunts infused with Holocaust jokes and references, unquote. Pop culture icon Kanye West may have now backtracked on his hate-filled diatribes against Jews, but the damage he did is explosive, and I dare say will continue to have an overwhelming influence and impact on Jew hatred and Jew haters well into the future. The ADL reports that, quote, Kanye West is right and kill all the Jews. They were written alongside three swastikas on the wall of a bathroom, school bathroom in Newport Beach, California in October. The words Kanye was right about the Jews 
with swastikas and crossed out Star of David were found in the bathroom of the school in Newton, Massachusetts in November. His influence extended far beyond school settings, the report continues. In December, the Holocaust Center in Pittsburgh received an anti-Semitic phone call from an unknown caller who identified themselves using the name Kanye West and stated, quote, I hate all Jewish people. All of them must burn and die. I love Hitler. In late October, the message, yay, West was right about the devil Jews, was written in chalk outside the Jewish cemetery in Stockton, California. In November, headstones at the Jewish cemetery in Waukegan, Illinois, was vandalized with swastikas and the words Kanye was right, spelled incorrectly, mind you. This rise in open, out there, in your face Jew hatred is frightening. American attitudes towards Jews in another study conducted by the ADL also changed dramatically. Released in January of this year, a study that surveyed 4,000 individuals, which they termed, quote, a representative sample of the American population from September through October 2022, uncovered a radical uptick in anti-Jewish attitudes. According to the executive summary, quote, over three quarters of Americans, 85%, believe at least one anti-Jewish trope as opposed to 61% found in 2019. 20% of Americans believe six or more tropes, which is significantly more than the 11% that the ADL found in 2019, and is the highest level measured in decades. These numbers don't lie. However much I wish they did, they don't lie. The trend needs to be reversed. That can only happen when good, honest Americans stand up and say, no, enough to the senseless and very destructive hatred against the Jew. Coming up next, points of view. I want to discuss two columns today, both from the Times of Israel. The first column was written by Je Zev Chaifetz. The second is a direct response to Chaifetz, written by a 20-year-old named Zev Bell. Chaifetz's column appeared on March 22nd and Bell's on March 23rd, one right after the other. Ostensibly, the columns are about the judicial reform in Israel and the controversy, but they are really about Israel and about Israelis' perception of themselves and about the idea of Israeli unity. Chaifetz's column is entitled, Separation Now, subtitled, Liberals Can't Seduce Haredim with Modernity, and Haredim Can't Seduce Liberals with Talmud. It's time to stop pretending. Chaifetz begins, like everyone I know or care to know, I have been demonstrating in the streets of Tel Aviv, but I have not joined my fellow protesters in their chants for democratia. It is a battle cry that misunderstands the real crisis that Israel faces. There is too much democracy here, not too little. The government headed by Bibi Netanyahu was elected fair and square. Nobody is accusing the winners of the voter fraud or intimidation or sleight of hand the contest was a pure exercise in electoral democracy. The people spoke. From the point of view of Tel Aviv liberals, these are the wrong people. Tel Aviv democracy comes with a set of values. These include an independent judiciary that protects the rights of minorities and can check government power, a modern educational system based on intellectual curiosity and scientific knowledge, full gender equality, and gay rights, universal military conscription, or an alternative form of patriotic service, and active participation in the national economy. As Chaifetz continues his column, he explains that there is an absolute divide between those in the Netanyahu government who want reform and the liberals who reject it, not just in Tel Aviv, but throughout the country. Chaifetz writes, the Black Hats faction of the government, upon which the Netanyahu government depends, does not simply reject this form of liberalism, they despise it. Their clear and oft-repeated goal is to eventually install a theocracy run according to Talmudic law, as interpreted by venerated rabbis. Such a society will necessarily separate its citizens by gender, ban school subjects that contradict the literal text of the Torah and the Talmud 
outlaw godless technology, and put a tight lid on personal freedom and public speech. As Heifetz continues his column, he argues that Ben-Gurion did not in any way or shape anticipate this issue arising during the first years of the State of Israel. As he put it, David Ben-Gurion, a visionary in many ways, did not see this coming. He thought black hats were a relic of the ghetto. Their children, he believed, would assimilate as new Jewish men and women. He thought it harmless to allow the poor rabbis to establish their own government subsidized school system. A quarter of the school-aged Jews are now Haredi. They are raised and educated in a segregated community with almost no knowledge or contact with the outside world. They are taught to see secular Israelis as a pernicious species of Goyim and the Zionist state of Israel as a grave crime against divine decree. Chayfetz's critique is very biting, even hateful. The reader can sense the anger he harbors for religious Jews in these next few lines. He writes, The only Israeli holiday the Haredim celebrate is Election Day. Democracy and demography have made them Democrats. The rabbis may hate the Israeli Supreme Court, but they love the Supreme Court in Washington, D.C., which enshrined the one-person, one-vote rule. The political rabbis have embraced that simple mantra like the 11th commandment. The ballot is their birthright, a priceless and irrevocable gift handed to them by their Zionist adversaries. Chavitz concludes by offering a suggestion he's been thinking about for a long time. It's a suggestion he even wrote about during his tenure at the Jerusalem Report. Zev Chavitz suggests a total separation. He suggests dividing Israel into two completely different entities. And now, the response. Zev Bell is a young religious Zionist. He takes Chayfetz to task and suggests that Chayfetz has it all wrong. His column is entitled, To Zev Chayfetz, Othering Jews is the Opposite of the Zionist Dream. Subtitled, When you badmouth Israel's Haredim, you display your prejudice against this segment of the population. You are also wrong. This is how Bell begins. I recently read with dismay Zev Chavitz's Times of Israel blog post suggesting that Israeli Haredim, who he pejoratively called the Black Hats, establish their own state and separate from the rest of the liberal Israeli society. Apart from the tone of the piece, which is condescending at best and vitriolic at worst, his argument is overly simplistic and misses the point of the Zionist dream. It is also emblematic of a pervasive intolerance towards Haredim in many Jewish circles, a phenomenon which is often overlooked. First, Chayfetz draws a false dichotomy between liberals and the black hats. In addition to the prejudice term he employs that mocks the unique dress of a minority, a standard which is not and should not be tolerated for other minorities, the picture he paints is one in which Haredim oppose all elements of a liberal society, an independent judiciary among them with the rest of the country supporting it. And this is far from the reality on the ground. Bell explains just how mistaken Chayfetz is by pointing out that the proponents and the details and the facts behind the judicial reform are not at all what they seem. They are not, according to Bell, Haredim at all, he writes. The largest party in Israeli government currently pushing illiberal policy positions is the Likud which is historically a secular party, albeit somewhat traditional slant. Its leader, the current prime minister, is a secular Jew. Benjamin Netanyahu and its secular justice minister, Yariv Levin, is at the forefront of the current attempt to weaken Israel's judiciary. Mostly Likud voters are not Haredi, and a significant swath of them are secular. Religious Zionists, the sector, not the party, are also among the most prominent propagators of the plan, such as Simcha Rothman, although many oppose it as well. Clearly, it is not a Haredi liberal divide. It is a divide of people who support the plan versus people who do not, with each side containing members of all segments of Israeli society. Even if various groups incline towards a certain position, 
there has been many right-wing figures who have come out against the plan or have implored the government to compromise. In his conclusion, Bell again emphasizes that all Haredim are not the same. Speaking of Chayfetz, Bell writes, he presents all Haredim as vociferous opponents of Zionism and the State of Israel, when in reality much of the Haredi society is simply non-Zionist, not anti-Zionist, non-Zionist with many people valuing positive relations with the state. In fact, the largest Haredi party, Shas, officially associates with the World Zionist Congress. The Zionist dream is not one of separated Jewish polity. The Jewish people should share a state because we share a future. The response to disagreement ought to be dialogue, not division. But even if separation were a prudent policy position, there are ways to talk about issues without resorting to condescension and hasty generalizations, as is regrettably done in the post. We should all heed Rabbi Jonathan Sachs's call to reject the politics of anger and embrace the politics of hope, and recognize that the people not like us are just people like us. Because in his words, there is dignity that lies in our differences. Anashim achim anachnu. We are all one nation with one unified fate. This is a very important discussion, and there are always going to be issues and decisions that we agree with and others upon which we will disagree. What is critical is that we continue to discuss the issues and the differences between us, to discuss them with civility and respect for those whose thinking does not align with our own. As of now, the judicial reform legislation has been tabled until the summer. Between now and then, hopefully, there will be a series of serious conversations and maybe even some resolutions. Coming up, commentary through cartoons where pictures tell the story. I want to show you five cartoons and memes today. The first two cartoons discuss March Madness. For those who don't follow college basketball, March Madness is the title given to the season during which fans pick their winning school teams and spend a lot of time watching and vicariously playing college basketball. It's an organized and often very popular system. It has brackets. And so this first cartoon pokes fun at the crazy natural events that have plagued us in March. The cartoon is titled March Madness. In place of the brackets, you would expect to see listing opposing college teams. One side of these brackets has rain, ice, sleet, etc. The other side reads 78 degrees, 28 degrees, locusts, and others. Looking at the bracket, the man in the blue shirt emblazoned on, on it says National Weather Service explains it's this week's forecast. Admittedly, I'm not a big basketball fan but I do pay attention to the weather. In this next cartoon, we see a sportscaster who says, it's the race to the final four, sitting on the couch in their living room. A wife turns to her husband and asks, is he talking about basketball or the banks? That's hilarious. This next meme is very funny. It focuses on changes between then and now and just how dramatic the changes have been. The meme reads, the difference between learning a modern language and an ancient language is that in the first year of French, you learn, where is the bathroom and how do I get to the train station? In first year Attic Greek or Latin, you learn, I have judged you worthy of death and the tyrant had everyone killed in the city. <laughs> it happens to be very true. This shirt is a classic for everyone who loves Star Wars and Star Trek and knows the difference between them and hates it when people confuse the two. The shirt reads, Star Wars number one fan, but the picture of the spaceship is from Star Trek. It's the USS Enterprise that drives people bananas. This next meme is just a wonderful picture from one of those contests that asks readers to come up with a great caption. The caption that was selected is, when you are fighting a lion in a river and both of you see a crocodile. Just look at the expression of both of those characters in the picture. 
This last meme is a sign in the hardware store that sells pesticides. We see a skull perched on top of the sign and the aisle reads, the aisle of death. Pest control, weed killer, bug killer. <laughs> in a moment, more of my own perspective and a few predictions. Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu announced that he will pull the move for judicial reform legislation and will work on the compromise so that it can be resumed and resubmitted after the summer break. Officially, the legislation will not go on for a second or third reading in the Knesset. For now, it's been scuttled. Netanyahu finally understood that the proposal, as it stood, would cause more damage than good for Israel and for Israelis, not only at home, but also abroad. Now the question is, how long his coalition can stay together? We will watch and see. I'm not placing bets right now. Additionally, Netanyahu's religious nationalist coalition government survived a no-confidence motion filed by the opposition in protest of the judicial overhaul plan. According to the Knesset speaker, the motion failed by a vote of 59 to 53. This means that as of now, the government is still pretty much secure. The opposition would need eight votes to topple the Netanyahu government. If, however, some of the coalition partners are not happy with the slowdown on the judicial reform legislation, the government could fall at any time. That's why I'm not making any bets. Israel and the United Arab Emirates signed a free trade agreement. The agreement, as explained by Israel's foreign ministry, will reduce or remove tariffs on 96% of the goods traded between the nations. Israel and the United Arab Emirates first reached the agreement last May, promising to boost bilateral trade after they normalized ties in 2020 in the U.S. brokered deal. The relationship between Israel and the United Arab Emirates is a fast becoming a model for other Arab countries and their relationship with Israel. The Israeli National Emergency Authority has published future summer scenarios for the period between June and September that could be the result of climate change. One of the scenarios would be two intense three to four day heat waves occurring every month during the four month period. Temperatures could soar to 120 degrees Fahrenheit Aggregate electricity consumption could rise by 10%, and mortality, that is the death rate, would rise by 8.5%, and the chance of fires erupting would substantially increase. When it gets that hot, the weather becomes a danger and a factor of life and death. The foreign ministers of the countries that are members of the Gulf Cooperation Council, including Bahrain, Kuwait, Oman, Qatar, Saudi Arabia, and the United Arab Emirates, addressed a letter to the United States Secretary of State, Antony Blinken, in which they condemned Israeli Minister of the Treasury, Bitsala Smotrich's recent remarks. He made several remarks that are important here, one on the non-existence of the Palestinian people. Another, Smotrich spoke in front of a map of Greater Israel, which included Jordan's borders. He also called for the wiping out of a Palestinian city called Huwara. The representatives called on the U.S. to act against these hurtful remarks and strive towards reaching a solution for the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. A death toll from the U.S. airstrikes on pro-Iranian installations in eastern Syria has risen to 19, a Syrian war monitor said. It has been one of the deadliest exchanges between the U.S. and Iran-aligned forces in years. The U.S. carried out the strikes in eastern Syria in response to a drone attack that left one American contractor dead and another contractor and five U.S. troops wounded. Washington said the attack on their drone was of an Iranian origin. The Syrian foreign ministry condemned U.S. strikes on its territory, saying Washington had lied about what they were targeting and pledged to, quote, end the American occupation of its territory, unquote. The U.S. said that it carried out strikes on facilities affiliated with Iran's Revolutionary Guard in Syria. They're located in Syria sometimes, only after the drone attack killed an American contractor. Saudi Foreign Minister Prince Faisal bin Farhan al Saud and his Iranian counterpart Hussein Amira Abdulhayin 
have agreed to meet soon and pave the way for the reopening of embassies under a deal to reestablish ties. Saudi state news agency SPA said, Earlier this month, Iran and Saudi Arabia agreed to revive relations after years of hostility that had threatened stability and security in the Gulf and helped fuel conflicts in the Middle East from Yemen to Syria. Most of the roughly 2.5 tons of natural uranium ore recently declared missing from the site in Libya has been found at the site. The UN nuclear watchdog told member states in a statement reported by Reuters. Following up on Eastern Libyan forces statement last week that they had found the drums near the warehouse, they were taken from southern Libya. In the International Atomic Energy Agency's report, they carried out an inspection and found that only, quote, a relatively small amount of the uranium was still unaccounted for. The confidential statement said to member states, we've been thinking out loud about a lot today. Now that you know what I've been thinking, let me know what you're thinking. Email me at micah at jbstv.org. Tweet me at Micah Halpern. Tell me what you think. Before we leave, let me leave you with one picante piece of information. Did you know that sometimes leaders lose track of essential issues? Sometimes they disappoint their constituents. We hear grumbling throughout democracies around the world after almost every election. And we also hear the expressions, the people have spoken, the expression, democracy works. And that is true. Democracy does work. To make it work well, though, there are important concepts that need to always be in place. They're concepts. They're sort of rules, but unwritten rules. This is the case in the United States and also the case in Israel. A majority, a narrow majority, let's say even of one or two or three, is not a mandate. A mandate to change, to radically change and alter the system, should morally, if not legally, require more than a simple majority. A mandate means a significant majority. A majority means just over 50%, over half. Often we're speaking about the plurality, which is more than everyone else, but not even more than half. That's what the plurality is. That cannot be considered a mandate by any standard. There is no doubt that societies need to improve and fine tune themselves to iron out the kinks, but that needs to be done slowly. The masses need to be educated and brought into the process so that the change is accepted and that the mandate is obviously clear. To be clear, narrow margins of victory are not mandates for radical change. Thank you for thinking out loud with me, Micah Halpern. Let's think out loud again next week on JBS.